All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today's topic is something that has been long requested and it's about time I actually did this video. It is about how I develop recipes. What are the methods that I use to take a beer from just simply concept to actually a recipe that I eventually brew on my YouTube channel here? If it's your first time here though, I wanna say thank you for checking out the channel and welcome on this channel. I'll typically either do a grain to glass video where I'm taking a beer from start to finish in a single video, or I'll be doing a different kind of video like this one on various topics in home brewing. If you like either of those things, please go ahead, hit that subscribe button and also hit that like button so YouTube knows to recommend this type of stuff to you in the future. There's a couple things I need to preface this video with. First of all, recipe development is a very subjective thing. The way that I like to make my recipes is going to be different than the way that other people like to make their recipes. Uh, the brewing software that I use is going to be different than other people's. The methods that I use are going to be different than other people's. At the end of the day, it's all about what kind of beer do you want to make and what are you comfortable with doing? Um, that's really the core of it. Uh, it's a very subjective thing, so just keep that in mind as you're listening to this video. The second thing is that this is not a tutorial. I'm not going to give you instructions on how to use Beersmith. I'm, that's a completely different topic, and there are honestly a lot of people out there who could do that a lot better than I can. Um, so today's going to be more oriented towards what are the methods and general high-level concepts that I use to develop my recipes. The last thing is that I'm going to try and teach you as much as I can, but at the end of the day, Nothing really beats experience when it comes to actually brewing the beer that uh, you want to make. Uh, you have to brew enough to really kind of understand the methods and you have to get the skills down as a decent brewer to be able to make good beer. Um, it's not all about the recipe, it's not all about the equipment, it's all about the skills, the fundamentals, the actual techniques that you use are really pretty important in terms of making a good beer. The good news is brew enough and you'll get to that point. And that's the whole reason pre-made recipes exist on YouTube and in books and in recipe kits. And so people don't have to do the legwork to developing their own recipes. But if you follow those recipes enough, you'll start to notice things, you'll start to pick up on stuff and you'll start to get that experience that you need to be able to make your own recipes. And if you think you're now at that level where you want to take that leap and you want to start making your own recipes, I highly encourage you to do it. Just Take that leap to get started. Make your own personalized beer the way that you want to make it and make something that's truly yours. That's honestly one of the best parts about homebrewing is just being able to design your own recipes and then make them yourself to have a product that is truly all yours. The first thing is, unless you're looking at a very specific kind of beer, um, I would just advise you to look at what kind of generic style do you want to make. I know, for example, I'm looking at brewing my Christmas beer pretty soon, and uh, what I want to do with that is actually make a Weizenbach, uh, which is a strong German wheat beer. Because it's a Christmas beer, I know I'm probably going to throw some spices in it, and because it's a strong beer, I know that now I have a timeline I got to adhere to. I've got to actually let this thing sit and age for a little bit so that it mellows out nicely uh, before I serve it. Once you have a generic style figured out, then you can start doing research. There is absolutely nothing wrong with researching the beer that you want to make. Um, it's actually something I would highly encourage you to do so that you learn as much as possible about it to arm yourself with as much information as possible, especially if it's the first time you're actually making something. The next step is to look at things like the BJCP guidelines. The BJCP is kind of the ultimate resource for determining what makes a particular style of beer uh, its own unique thing and what would be a good version and what would be a bad version. I'll link the BJCP style guidelines in the description box. It breaks down things like what is the OG supposed to be? What's the color? What's the, you know, the hoppiness in terms of IBUs? What's the overall percentage ABV? What are the flavors you're supposed to have in there versus what are the flavors that you're not supposed to have in there? What's considered bad uh, for this style? It gives you a lot of information that you might need in order to make the best version of that beer. The one caveat on the BJCP guidelines is that, in fact, they are guidelines. They are not hard rules unless you are submitting your beer to a competition. So feel free to go outside those bounds if you want to. If you want to express a little bit of creativity there, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, odds are, though, if you make a beer that falls within the guidelines, it's going to be a good representation of what that style of beer is. Once you have all that stuff lined up, the next step is to just honestly spend some time looking at other recipes of beer. There's a lot of publicly available recipes out there. If you're brewing a beer that you've already made before um, and you took good notes during that brew day and you remember what happened, go back and look at that as your first source. You're gonna learn a lot more from your own experience than you will from somebody on the internet. Um, and I highly encourage you to make that your first stop before you actually go looking anywhere else, if you've already made the beer, of course. 
One of the best places to get information and recipes all in the same place are from books. Uh, so I'd recommend books like the IPA book by Mitch Steele, uh, Brewing Classic Styles, or looking at maybe the How to Brew Like a Monk book if you if you want to look into Belgian beers. Uh, all these books are great resources for recipes uh, that are pre-existing that um, you know are built by people that know what they're doing. A couple other options out there, you have the AHA website. If you're an American Home Brewers Association member, you have access to their vast library of recipes. And they have recipes for every single style of beer for decades. Um, and some of those beers are actually winners at like the National Homebrew Competition. And it, there's a lot of really cool resources that are uh, available there. And that's another great option to kind of start looking at data. The next place to look for information is actually YouTube. This of course is what my channel is basically all about, but there's also a lot of other YouTubers out there that also do recipe building. And it is well worth looking into their recipes, looking into their beers, seeing how they turned out and seeing, hey, is that what I wanna make? And it very well might be. Again, this is another data point to allow you to brew your best possible version of that beer. The last option is looking through old internet forums. I wouldn't really recommend relying on this. It is ultimately another data point, but a lot of times the posts in those forums that involve recipes are actually written by people who are asking for other people's advice on that recipe. So they may not actually have fully figured out what they want their recipe to be before putting it out there on the internet and then you get hits on it when you Google that particular type of beer. I would just encourage you to be cautious about those, um, but otherwise, combine all of the data that you get from all of these other sources, then you'll start to see patterns. You'll start to see things show up in almost every single recipe for a particular kind of beer. And that's the stuff that you need to pay attention to. That's the stuff that you probably should incorporate into your own recipes. So once you have all these data points uh, and you've looked at all of these different recipes and you're kind of starting to figure out what those patterns are, you're starting to figure out what are those things that really are important for this particular kind of beer. Now it's time to start building your recipe. So at this point, you need to go into your brewing software of choice. And if you're not using brewing software, you really should be. I really do think that it makes a huge difference in terms of making an accurate beer. If you take a kit beer and brew it on one system versus a different system, you're gonna have two wildly different beers at the end of the day. The thing is, everyone's system is different. It's all gonna behave differently. Everyone brews differently. It is really worth getting some kind of software to help you get a better guess of what your final beer is gonna end up like. Um, it, it really makes you a lot more consistent. It makes you a better brewer. I highly encourage it. So the next step is to go into either Brewer's Friend or Beersmith or Brew Father or whatever your preferred brewing software is uh, to determine how your beer is gonna go. And at that point, you can start to kind of either copy in somebody else's recipe and tweak the values or put together the ingredients that you know you wanna use in your beer uh, into that software. At that point, you will have to make adjustments for your own system. If you have an equipment profile already loaded into your brewing software, that's where you do that. And it's at this point that brewing software really shines because you're gonna need to make tweaks for your uh, system's efficiency and for its own individual quirks. Uh, if you've brewed enough on your own system using brewing software, you'll know kind of what makes sense and what doesn't. That part, I can't teach you. It is ultimately up to you to build the experience to actually make that work. So shortly, we are gonna go into Beersmith and I'm gonna show you kind of how I build a recipe and we'll use my holiday Weizenbach as an example. But first, I'm gonna kind of give you a couple guidelines that I think are gonna help you make better recipes. If you're trying to make the most authentic version of a particular beer, I just encourage you to try your hardest to use the continental ingredients for that kind of beer. So, you know, for example, if I'm making a German Pilsner, I wanna make sure that I'm using uh, German Pilsner malt from a German maltster like Weiermann and using German hops like Pearl and probably Hallertau Mittelfer and using a German lager yeast like, you know, maybe the, the Weinstefen lager yeast. If you make the same beer using American Pilsner malt and American hops and American lager yeast, you're gonna make a completely different beer. Um, not saying it'll be a bad beer, but it'll be a completely different beer. If you watch my Pilsner series, you'll understand exactly how important continental ingredients really are. The next tip I have for you is to take it easy on specialty malts and uh, adjunct ingredients. The more specialty malts and adjuncts you add to something, the more extra layers of flavor you'll get, which is a good thing sometimes, but it can be very easily overdone. 
Um, Genus Brewing is very popular for saying caramel malts are the devil and should never be used in any recipe. Where they're coming from is that caramel malts are overused as simply a method to add sweetness and color, when in reality there are like literally tens of other different alternatives for each kind of uh, caramel malt. More often than not, you're gonna be making a better beer when you're using malts like Caramunic and Special B instead of things like Crystal 60 and Crystal 120. That's kind of how that cookie crumbles, but oftentimes if you're making a beer that has more than five malts in it and it's not something like a Russian Imperial Stout or like a Belgian Quad, you're probably doing something wrong. If you have too many specialty malts, you ultimately are gonna have too high of a final gravity. You're gonna have too sweet of a final beer and it can get that kind of weird homebrew flavor out of it by having too muddy of a flavor. Um, so I would just encourage you not to do that. Try to keep your recipes as simple as you can. Uh, oftentimes, the simpler is the better option. The final tip I have for you is try to keep it balanced uh, if you can. Most beers, unless they're something like a pastry stout or a West Coast IPA, are ultimately going to have some sort of balance struck between sweetness and bitterness. This is something that I've talked about before in this video, uh, but ultimately striking a balance between sweetness and bitterness and kind of erring towards the middle of that balance is ultimately going to make a better tasting beer nine times out of ten, unless you're in one of those fringe cases. So just try to keep that in mind. So if you're brewing like an amber ale and you're starting to look at like 70 IBUs, you're probably going to want to dial things back a little bit. Um, or if you're looking at an Irish stout and your final gravity's creeping up towards like 10, 14, you're going to want to dial things back a little bit and change some processes. So just little things to think about. Try to keep everything as balanced as possible and you're going to make better beer at the end of it. So at this point now, we're going to go ahead and try to apply all of those principles that I just talked about in a practical example and we're going to build the recipe for my holiday Weizenbach. So the recipe that comes out of this video is the recipe that I will be brewing that with. So if you're watching this in the future and I've already made that beer, um, it's going to pop up here in the card notification that you'll see on screen shortly. If you click on that card notification and go to that video, you'll see just how well this recipe development actually ended up working out. So now what we're going to do is take these principles that I've outlined and uh, we're going to try and use them to help design my Christmas beer for this year, the uh, spiced Weizenbach that I'll be making. So in my mind, I'm kind of envisioning something that's very similar to the Schneider Weiss Aventinus, which is a, uh, a darker version of a Weizenbach. It's a very, very much like a dark fruit kind of character. Um, and it's actually one of my favorite beers of all time. So that I think is gonna stand up to the holiday spices a little bit better than something like a more pale Weizenbach. So based on that, I have two good starting places. First of all, the BJCP guidelines for a Weizenbach. And secondly, the uh, Schneider Weiss um, Aventinus kind of product description, right? So there's a couple nuggets in there that might be useful for uh, looking at this particular beer. So now I got the VJCP pulled up here, and we're just going to kind of look through the Weizenbach category. This is category 10C. This is a very long paragraph, so I'm just going to kind of keep it short here, but the overall impression of the Weizenbach is a strong, malty, fruity, wheat-based ale combining the best malt and yeast flavors of a Weiss beer, pale or dark, with the malty-rich flavor strength and body of a Dunkelsbach or a Doppelbach. Um, it's a pretty good description in my opinion. You know, he mentions a lot of things about uh, a good, strong, malty aroma uh, with... Some dark fruits uh, for the darker versions, which is what we're going to be targeting. Um, there should be a complex bouquet, and you can go from a dark amber to a dark ruby brown in color for the dark stuff. Should be a long-lasting head, um, and then there should be some haze as well. So the flavor um, is going to be a medium-high to high multi-rich flavor uh, with bready and grainy character, uh, and then plenty of toasted malt flavors for Maillard products. Um, low to moderate banana and spice, and then darker versions can have some dark fruit flavor such as plums, prunes, grapes, or raisins, uh, and sometimes even a light chocolate flavor, although a roast is not appropriate. Uh, there should be no hop flavor. Um, a low hop bitterness can give a slightly sweet palate impression, but the beer typically finishes dry. That's interesting. Medium to full body with a fluffy or creamy texture as well. Um, characteristic ingredients, typically you're looking at about 50% malted wheat. Um, that's pretty typical for any sort of uh, German Weiss beer style or derivative. It says the remainder can be made up of Munich or Vienna type malts and some Pils malts as well. Traditionally, it's decoction mashed. I know for a fact right now I don't want to do that with a wheat beer ever again. Um, but it's, uh, we have a little bit of a workaround for that later on. Basically, compared to some of the similar styles, Says it's stronger and richer than a Weiss beer or a Dunkel's Weiss beer. 
uh, but with the similar yeast character, more directly comparable to Doppelbach style. There's also some of those uh, critical data points here. OG should be about 1064 to 1090. Uh, FG should be 1015 to 1022, uh, 15 to 30 IBUs, SRM 6 to 25 for color, and ABV of 6.5 to 9%. Uh, so that's kind of giving us our ground rules, right? So now let's go over to the actual Schneider Weiss website. And now we're going to look at the Aventinus itself and kind of what they have is as a description here. Um, so they call it a wheat Doppelbach. That's essentially what it is, um, but it does fall under the Weizenbach category. So it's 8.2% ABV. They use Hallertau Hercules and a uh, combination of wheat and barley malt, open fermentation, uh, re-fermented in the bottle for bottle conditioning, uh, 16 IBUs, and then a original gravity of 18.5 degrees Play-Doh. Um, so that's like 1076 uh, OG. And I know based on that now that if I have an original gravity of 1076, um, in order to get 8.2% ABV and a similar character with a similar residual sweetness, I'm probably going to want to get down to about 1014 uh, for a final gravity. On top of that, you know, we have only 16 IBUs of overall bitterness, so I can use that to kind of tune this recipe uh, to be something very similar, at least in terms of the overall sweetness and alcohol percentage of the Aventinus. So now we're going to go ahead and look into doing some other research in other parts of the internet. Uh, I'm going to do pretty much everything I can here on camera uh, with uh, the internet. Uh, so we're going to start with what is probably one of my favorite resources on the internet, and that is the uh, American Home Brewers Association website. Um, if you have an AHA account, it's definitely worth it. It's a small fee you pay every month, but you get access to some of the world's best recipes. And then also you get the ability to go to things like Homebrew Con and the National Homebrew Competition. You get to submit entries for those sorts of things. Uh, so it's definitely worth doing. I primarily use it for their recipes though. So there's literally thousands of recipes on the AHA website and there are hundreds of medal winning recipes. Uh, and in this case, I've just searched for Weizenbach and I have about seven selections here which have won either gold, silver, or bronze at the National Homebrew Competition at one point in time, which is pretty cool that these are just available. Um, so I'm basically just gonna pop a bunch of them open and see kinda what the general trends are. So for this one, we're looking at 8.9%, uh, 24 IBUs, we're using dark wheat malt, Pilsner, Munich, uh, Crystal 60, Special B, and chocolate malt with Hallertau to bitter at 60, using WLP 300, that's your standard Hefeweizen and strain. And then he is using a uh, step mash here um, as well. So that's one entry. This one has uh, 6.7 and 26 IBUs. We're looking at, yeah, a large amount of light German wheat, uh, some German rye, which is pretty cool. Uh, a little bit of Pilsner, a little bit of Vienna, some dark Munich, uh, bittering with Horizon, and then adding uh, some Tetnanger and Pecco. Hmm. A little bit of Saz at the end, that's kind of cool. And then uh, Bavarian Weizen yeast. We've got this one here, which is 7.4%, 20 IBUs. Uh, we're looking at Dark Wheat Malt again, Pilsner again, Dark Munich, uh, Melanoidin, Special B again, Medium Crystal again, and some Chocolate Malt, uh, Herzbrucker to, to bitter with, um, and then Hefeweizen 4. This one uses a single infusion mash at a high mash temperature. On to this one here, um, we have 7% and no IBUs listed. Here we got, yeah, some white wheat malt, some pale malt, some dark Munich, some pale chocolate, Kara Munich for the first time, uh, Melanoidin, Hallertau at the beginning and the end, um, and then Hefeweizen 4. And then we got one last one here. Um, we got basically wheat malt, pale malt, chocolate malt, more pale malt, um, and Tetnanger, and then you use the Hefeweizen, the standard Hefeweizen strain. Uh, with a single infusion mash. Okay, so looking at these, I've got some ideas. Now we'll head over to another resource that I like to use a lot, which is the Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine website. They have a series on there entitled Make Your Best 
insert beer style. There's an author by the name of Josh Weikert. He is a very experienced home brewer. Um, he's meddled on pretty much every one of these beers and he is offering his insights into brewing the style. Um, and that is for pretty much every single style of beer in the BJCP as well. So this is kind of the same approach as uh, the Brewing Classic Styles book gives. Um, where basically you have a breakdown of what is good about the style and what the particular brewer likes to do uh, for their version of the beer and then giving you a, a sample recipe to try out. So we're gonna head over there now. So we have Make Your Best Weizenbach. Josh Weikert here says use wheat malt, Vienna malt, Munich malt, um, and then adding in a little bit of medium crystal, some special B again, and some chocolate rye, which is a pretty cool idea. Um, and then a quarter pound of melanoidin. He says after that, hop to about 30 IBUs uh, as a bittering addition, and then uh, yeast is your typical YS3068, the, the Weinstefan strain. So there you go. What we have here is a pretty good idea of what some commonalities are between the different types of Weizenbach recipes. So basically it looks like we got ourselves a whole bunch of patterns here. So for a base malt, we're looking at, well, 50% wheat malt, either light or dark, or a blend of the both. Um, not sure if I want to do a blend or just dark yet, uh, but I'll think about that over the next few minutes. Um, and then we have um, a bunch of toasted malts and regular German base malts. So I've seen a lot of Munich. I've seen especially dark Munich in these darker versions of the Weizenbach. I've seen a lot of Vienna and I've seen a lot of Pilsner. And layering in those individual base malts really does actually add a lot of complexity. And that is something that we're probably going to do. So that's, uh, that's going to get us a decent amount. Um, beyond that, then we start layering in specialty malts, and I've seen a whole bunch of special B being used. That does not surprise me at all, because you're going to see a whole bunch of raisiny character coming from that. Um, plum and dates and those sorts of dark fruits that you're going to want with this style. There's also some melanoidin malt in there, because you're trying to simulate a decoction. That makes sense. That's definitely going to be in my version of this as well. Lastly, you look at the coloring malts. If everything I mentioned already doesn't really... Uh, get it to the color that I want, then I'm probably going to add in a touch of Carafa malt to get it a bit darker. Um, but there's not supposed to be any roastiness in this, so we want to be very careful about adding dark malts um, uh, so that we can kind of keep that under control. So for hops, it really looks like there's no real purpose to them beyond bittering, and at that we're only looking for like 16 to 20 IBUs really um, of bittering. Now the Schneider Weiss website does recommend using Hallertau Hercules which I can't find here, so I'm going to be using something different, which is Magnum. Um, that's a German hop, and it bitters extremely well, um, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, so we'll use probably a small amount of Magnum to bitter to about 16 or 20 IBUs, depending on uh, what the alpha acids are that I get uh, when I order it. For our yeast, uh, this is pretty simple. Um, it's going to be your favorite Hefeweizen strain. Uh, so that's that's been pretty much consistent across the board. I like to use YU3068, the Weinstefan Weizen, uh, which is uh, a great yeast for this. It produces loads of clove and banana flavors, depending on where you want to ferment that. And so since this is a Christmas beer, I kind of want to leverage that clove character. So that way I don't have to add actual cloves in uh, to the beer because I could totally ruin it if I don't do it right. For a mash, we want this to be relatively sweet, but not too sweet. So I'm going to probably take the lazy approach and just adjust my mash temperature uh, high enough to give me about 1014, 1015 final gravity. Um, that should be just fine. What I'm going to be doing for water profile, I'm not going to show you this on camera because I've covered it already in this video here, my water chemistry video. Um, but basically, I am going to be picking a water profile um, that is going to push the malt a little bit more than the uh, hops. And so that is going to ensure that this kind of feels fuller, feels sweeter. Um, so we're looking at a water profile that's going to be based very similarly on the Munich water profile after it's been boiled. So um, Brewer's Friend has a great water profile for brewing paler beers uh, kind of from the Munich region. Um, that I've used before and it actually works out really well. So I'm going to be adding a bunch of sodium to that water profile to kind of give a little bit more uh, fullness uh, of mouthfeel and then probably just otherwise leaving the water profile where it's at. So we'll cover the actual water profile target in the actual brewing video for this beer, uh, but just know that that's my methodology behind it is usually I just kind of start and I look at what is the overall character of the beer that I want. Is it gonna be full bodied, light bodied? Is it gonna be dry finishing, full finishing? Is it going to be hoppy in general or malty in general or just balanced? Um, and that's kind of where I basically do most 
most of it. For the boil, I'm probably gonna do a 90 minute boil just to give us a little bit more extra melanoidin character. And then also just to kind of give myself a little bit more boil condensation so I can get a little bit higher of an original gravity in case I miss the mark on the mash. Like boiling longer gives you a little bit more of that full melanoidin character, which you want, that's that richness and maltiness. Um, that's expected for this type of beer style. I'm gonna be adding a whole bunch of different spices to this in varying stages. Um, I have experience with pretty much all of them, so um, I kinda know how much to add, but if you don't have that much experience brewing the spices, I just highly recommend you add them with a very light hand. Um, it's very easy to overspice your beer, and it's a surefire way to ruin a beer if you overdo it. So just be very careful. It's it's amazing how easy it is to overspice a beer. Uh, so just add them with a very light hand. So now we're going to go over and we're going to go to Beersmith. This is what I use to build pretty much all my beers. Just make sure you have the appropriate equipment profile, which is the claw hammer kettle that I have here. You can download this from their website if you have one of the kettles. Um, and then we're gonna start adding stuff. So I'm gonna start by adding in some dark wheat malt and probably about 10 pounds of that. Um, just for starters, let's see where that gets us. Beyond that, I wanna add in some Munich, some Vienna and some Pilsner malt. Now, because this is a dark version of this beer, I'm probably gonna use some dark Munich malt. Um, so let's start, add in maybe like four pounds of that. Um, and then some Vienna, so probably like Two pounds of that, I would say. And then let's go ahead and add in some regular old Pilsner to keep this kind of from being too heavy. <laughs> uh, make it kind of balanced. I'm gonna say maybe it's another two pounds of that. Okay. Um, now we're looking at a very high OG compared to what I actually wanted. So we want a 1076 OG. Uh, this is looking like it's a little too big here. So let's scale this down a little bit. Um, Let's maybe bring our base malt down to like eight pounds. That might make more sense. Uh, so that's like 1077, but we still have a couple specialty malts to add in here, which are partially fermentable. So I might bring down maybe the Munich malt a little bit here. Um, yeah, that gives us a little bit more room. Um, next, we're gonna add in some specialty malts. Now, I'm thinking through this. This is supposed to have some dark fruit character. It's supposed to have some malt richness. So that means that I'm gonna add definitely that special B. I definitely want that in there uh, in some quantity. And then also definitely some melanoidin malt. That's gonna give us some extra layers of complexity, some extra maltiness. Um, but I kind of also want a little bit of that caramel sweetness in there, but not from a caramel malt. I like to use the Weirman Caramunic malt for adding that middle dimension um, in many beers, actually. Um, it's a delicious malt and has notes of chocolate when used properly. Um, and I kind of want that to come in here a little bit. So I'm going to add a little bit of Special B, a little bit of Caramunic, and a little bit of Melanoidin. So, very, very light hand on these, even in a strong beer like this. Uh, so probably no more than half a pound of each, but half a pound of melanoidin is a lot too. So I'm probably gonna do like half a pound of Caramunic, half a pound of Special B, and then maybe a quarter pound of the uh, melanoidin. So let's go do that now. For our color, as you can see, it's pretty dark. Um, it's, a, it's probably gonna end up actually being a little bit darker than the Aventinus, and that's okay. Um, but kind of a point here to make is that if you wanted this beer to be darker, or say for some reason this was actually a lighter beer to begin with, um, then actually this is a good point to add in Carafa too. Literally just enough to fit in the palm of your hand is enough to take a beer from gold to red. And then a little bit more than that will take your beer all the way to black. If I wanted to take this beer from where it is now to just being jet black, all I need to do is add a couple ounces. Um, and then, you know, say you didn't have your dark wheat in there, say you're using a regular pale wheat um, and you wanted this to have a nice red tinge, then just toss in maybe like one ounce of Carafa too and you'll get right there. Um, but I'm not going to do that in this case. Uh, I thought I was going to have to, but it looks like we're actually going to be right where we want to be. And remember, this is going to be hazy. It's not going to be clear, so you're not going to get that red undertone. It's going to look brown. Um, and that's fine. You know, that's kind of what we want out of this, actually. So now, we'll add our hops. Um, I'm going to add in Magnum. So the alpha acid content of the Magnum I eventually receive may be different. So if that's the case, I just need to update it in here and adjust the content as necessary. If it's higher, I'll just bring it down to maybe a third of an ounce. If it's lower, uh, then I'll probably just raise it a little bit. But basically what we want to target here is the overall IBU um, uh, and of about 16. That's what we have here right now with half an ounce of 12% alpha acid Magnum. Um, so we'll see if that changes later on. 
Lastly, of course, we have our yeast, the Y-Yeast 3068. So I just adjusted my mash profile to be about 154, single infusion rest, uh, just to be sure that we know exactly where we're going to be with all this stuff. Um, and it's estimating a final gravity of 1020. Now, that final gravity of 1020 is not really accurate for me. Um, I'm probably going to end up seeing this drop a little bit lower, and that's just kind of my anecdotal experience with Beersmith. It's not always very accurate predicting final gravity. Um, but knowing that now, you know, I can kind of make that adjustment in my mind. So I know I'm probably going to see something more like 1015, and that's really what I actually want in reality. So now we're gonna talk about adding spices. I'm gonna add a whole bunch of spices during this brew, but some of them are going in during the boil and some of them are going in after fermentation. Uh, kind of as if you were dry hopping in the beer, you're like dry spicing the beer. When you boil it, it's gonna extract oils quickly, but you're also gonna lose aromatics. However, sometimes it's actually a little bit more beneficial to boil it, it's gonna give you different character. When you add it after fermentation, you're not gonna off gas and drive off these aromatics, uh, but you're also risking the potential of infections. Uh, so you're just gonna be careful with sanitation at that time. So at five minutes from the end of the boil, when I'm gonna add all of my boil spices, I'm gonna start out with fresh orange peel. So um, never use that stuff that's in the bag, just don't use it. It doesn't have any dimension of flavor and it's old and it's dried out and it just doesn't work very well. Um, so I highly recommend just go to the grocery store, get the juiciest orange you can find and just peel that sucker and throw the peel into the boil at the end and you're gonna have a much, much nicer uh, extraction of orange flavor. I did that for my wit beer video, which I'm gonna link up here in the corner. That fresh orange peel really made a world of difference in that beer, and it will in this one as well. The next thing I'm gonna add is half of a nutmeg. Not ground nutmeg, but like the actual nutmeg nut thing. Um, cut that in half, grind it up, put that in the boil. Um, that's gonna extract a whole bunch of nice, awesome uh, nutmeg flavor. But it's a very powerful spice, so we wanna be very careful with that and make sure it's not added in uh, too much quantity. The last thing we're gonna add at the end of the boil is just about a quarter teaspoon um, of ground ginger. This is the only spice in this entire thing that's not like a fresh spice. Um, the only reason I like to use the ground stuff is it is controllable and it's gonna be the same every time. Uh, the ginger you buy at the store is gonna have varying qualities. It might be old, it might be dried up, it might be hot ginger, it might be sweet ginger. Um, there's a whole bunch of variables that go into it. Depending on the crop and everything, you're gonna get different results with it. So I would prefer to just have control over that. Um, just, again, very light hand. So a quarter teaspoon of ground ginger is all that you're gonna need. Uh, so after fermentation is complete, we're gonna add cinnamon and vanilla beans. Uh, so cinnamon is one of those spices that if you boil it, it's gonna get really tannic and harsh. So that's why I don't like to use that one in the boil. I've done it before, it's okay, but it's just a little rough um, sometimes. So we're gonna add a couple cinnamon sticks kind of in a, in a spice bag. And I have to boil those in order to sanitize them though. Uh, the second thing we're gonna add is vanilla beans. And vanilla beans are uh, gonna add a whole like extra layer of umami kind of in this whole thing. So I'm not gonna really taste vanilla in this final beer. That's kind of the goal. Um, but what it's gonna do is add this really cool background. What it's gonna do is kind of trick your mind into believing there's some extra things in there that aren't actually in there. Um, and I'm just gonna add two beans and uh, let those soak in the beer for probably about seven days um, and then I'm gonna pull them out and we'll uh, transfer it into our uh, bottles. I think I'm gonna probably bottle this one because it should really bottle condition. Um, it's a traditional thing, but also I could give these away as gifts. Um, so we'll see how that goes. If I keg it at the end of the day, you know, that's what happens, but we'll see. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I really do hope you learned something. I hope you found it useful. Comment down below with your thoughts on this stuff. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button as well if you like what you saw today. If you wanna support the channel, I'd appreciate it if you bought a t-shirt. You can get this one. You can also get a bunch of others down in the merch store. You'll see that down below the description box. There's also a link in the description box. If you wanna support me on a more personal level, I have a Patreon, which is linked in the description box as well. Thank you very much to my current Patreon supporters. You guys are really making a big difference for this channel right now, and I am very appreciative of your support. If you're in the market for some home brewing equipment, I also have an Amazon store, which is in the description box that covers pretty much every single piece of home brewing equipment that I have used and recommend. So if you wanna shop through that store, it comes with my personal endorsement on each of those products. If you wanna follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram as the apartment brewer, and you will see me post a little bit more frequently than YouTube on 
Instagram. So if you guys are still watching at this point, you are my biggest fans, or you just forgot to click out of the window. Either way, I still really appreciate the watch time. So until the next one, cheers.